So you just picked up Nikkei for the jaw-dropping graphics, the deep plot, and the thrilling one-handed combat. My name is Psyche, and as a player that has been playing since launch, I'm going to be showing you step-by-step -step on how to play Nikkei effectively, starting from the very beginning. Welcome, this is Volume 1 of my detailed series of guides called Commander Bootcamp. Strap in, and let's begin the journey. So first off, as this is the first episode, I'm going to assume you are a new player that knows nothing or knows very little about the game. So I think it's best if we start in the beginning and go through some UI navigation. Now, before we even start pressing any buttons, a popular way to optimize your time playing Nikkei is asking yourself whether or not you want to re-roll your account. By gacha game definitions, the term re-rolling refers to keep making new accounts over and over again until you get a strong baseline roster of characters to start off with. Pridwin thinks that re-rolling is essential to get the most out of the game, but in my opinion, this is a waifu collection simulator. While it definitely helps to re-roll for meta units compared to some other gacha games, this is completely up to you. Here's a list of what the community considers as the best units in the game. You don't need to know what they do, you just have to know that they are very, very powerful. I'm not going to be doing a reroll guide, but some do exist online. The main draw of getting these units is that you'll be able to progress faster in both campaign and other challenge content. If we go into the late game campaign levels, you can see that the same meta units get used over and over. It's not that any roster can't beat these levels, it's just that you'll be able to beat them faster if you do. So let's assume you're happy with how your roster of characters look, and let's start talking about what to do next. In a fresh account, my recommendation for progressing fast is just by doing the campaign. If you navigate to the other menus, you'll notice that certain locations are unlocked from clearing a certain part in the story. We'll start by clicking the campaign button. You enter a level by forming a team. Luckily, the game gives you three to start off with, and you probably pulled some new units from the gacha. Each unit has their individual power level, and with all units combined is what determines your combat power or CP. Just don't say that in the wrong context. You'll notice that each level has a recommended combat power. This isn't really relevant as long as you're above set combat power. Each level can be easily cleared with any team except for a few exceptions. But there's one caveat to this mechanic. If you're below the recommended power level, the game actually secretly nerfs your team's stats depending on how far away you are from said recommendation. I would say the best thing to do is just progress in the campaign until you're physically unable to beat any levels. This is because you can upgrade your collection efficiency for materials the more campaign levels that you complete. This is found in the main menu, by the way. You will level up the machine once every five completed levels, which will in turn passively generate you more resources to level your units and pushing later campaign chapters. Since there's no stamina system in the game, you can keep playing the campaign until your team just isn't strong enough to beat any more. The majority of the game modes will unlock at around chapters 4 or 5, but that can easily be done in the first couple of days playing. Okay, so now you know your priority as a new player is to push the campaign. But how do you do that efficiently? Well, we have to understand the concepts of team building. You can fit up to 5 characters in one team. Each unit will have their own set of attributes. You can check out your roster anytime from the main menu from here. Let's click on Neon, for example, since everyone will have her. Let's try simplifying this menu so that it's not as cluttered. Starting from the leftmost icon, we have the unit's elemental affinity. There is a chart that shows all the affinities if you press this button when you're going into a level. This is pretty much irrelevant in the early game. Even in the late game, it doesn't matter that much. You basically deal effective damage against enemies of a certain affinity. But by default, the bonus is pretty minuscule at 10%. Some later bosses do have a shield where it breaks much faster if you hit it with a certain element. And I can't see how the game can expand on this in the future. But as a new player, you don't need to worry about affinities. The second icon is the weapon type that the unit uses. We can see that Neon is a shotgun user. There's quite a selection of weapon types in the game. Some perform better than others in certain situations. This definitely gets a bit more nuanced as the game progresses, but for the time being, you just need to know that different weapon types do exist, but you don't need to know the intricate details of each just yet. I know that the game will say something like shotgun users are better at short range and snipers for long range, this doesn't really become relevant until later into the game. 
The next icon is the class of the unit. There are three in the game, attacker, defender, and supporter. You can probably take a guess on what each of the classes specialize in. There's no rule in the game where you're only allowed to put a certain amount of classes in a team. It just gives you an idea of what area of expertise the unit is good at. Finally, we have the manufacturer. There are four factions or Nikkei manufacturers in the game. Elysian, Missilus, Tetra, and Pilgrim. There's technically a fifth, but you don't need to worry about that. Again, just like classes, the icon just tells you which manufacturer the unit belongs to. It's more of a lore thing, but there are cases where it matters. Down here are the four slots where you can equip gear for your units. They add to your Nikkei's total power level. But since you tend to progress really fast in the early game, you'll move on to the next tier of gear pretty quickly, so I wouldn't recommend leveling them past level 3. The tier of the gear is indicated by its color. It goes all the way to tier 9, which is what I have right now, but there are also variants of gear where you get a bonus if you match the gear with the unit's manufacturer. In the second tab, you can view or level your unit's skills. Each unit has three. Two of them will trigger passively or actively when certain conditions are met. And the last skill is the burst skill, which is something you have to trigger manually in battle. There's another tab at the bottom where you can place a harmony cube on a unit, but this doesn't matter in the early game for now. Now moving to the top a little, I saved this for last because I think this is the most important attribute that you should know about team building. There will be a Roman numeral here indicating the type of the unit. It's either 1, 2, or 3. At the bare minimum, you should have at least one of each type in your team at all times. This is because when you hit enemies enough times, you'll fill up your burst meter on the right side of the screen. When it gets filled, you will be able to activate the burst skill of a Type 1 unit in your team. When that happens, the game will then progress to the next type, Type 2. Activate that, then Type 3. Once all three types have been activated, you will enter what is known as Full Burst. In this state, all units will aim at the location on your cursor rather than doing their own thing, and you will get a 1.5 times damage multiplier during this state. It by default will last for 10 seconds, then you must fill up the burst gauge again. You cannot use the burst skill of a type 2 unit unless you use a type 1 unit's burst skill first, meaning if you don't have at least one of each type in a team, you cannot enter full burst. A typical team will consist of one type 1 and 2, and then three type 3s, or two type 1s, one type 2, and then two type 3s. In my days playing, it's rare for a team to have two Type 2s, which is why that slot tends to be a bit competitive. Luckily, the game gives you three characters to start off, and coincidentally, they cover all three types already. Wow, it's almost as if it's on purpose. Generally speaking, only the SSRs in the game are worth using in the late game. Early on, SRs can be used but eventually should be swapped out when you get more SSRs. Don't even think about using the blue characters, they're terrible, though some people love them for the memes. According to Pridwin, a good starter team looks like this, N102 as the Type 1, Anis as Type 2, and then three Type 3s. I know they also put Diesel here even though she's another Type 2. This is because as long as you're watching this before the Day by Day event finishes, then all players will get a copy of Diesel. So her SSR stats are still worth using. The reason why Neon gets swapped out is because she specifically buffs units with shotguns, and since a new player is unlikely to have a team that specialized, she gets replaced by N102, who is a more general supporter. You can honestly replace any of the Type 3s with anyone in your roster. I don't know what units you got from the gacha, but any SSRs will generally perform better than SRs on average. Since you can put a total of 5 units in a team, put in the 5 that you have leveled, do the campaign, and it's important that you continue to level these 5 units, but not others too. You don't want to spread yourself too thin. There's a reason for this I will explain later. For the time being, prepare your best 5 units, and just level them and them alone. Whenever possible, feel free to limit break any duplicate SRs that you get from the gacha. It will increase their stats and also increase their level cap. Okay, so you got a decent team going, you're into chapter 4 or 5 in the campaign, and you just unlock the outpost. This is basically your central hub where you upgrade your various stats, but also serves as a base building tycoon. You can click the actual locations of where things are, but the UI on the bottom can also serve as shortcuts. Let's start on the left. The Tactics Academy is basically a permanent upgrade system where in exchange for blueprints of certain buildings in the outpost, you can spend credits to gain permanent upgrades. Where do you find the building blueprints? From the maps of the campaign chapters. If you go to a spot where there's a white glowing orb, you can click on it and you will get a reward. Some of these rewards are building blueprints. 
Don't be worried if you can't get all the lessons done, you'll eventually get the blueprints from the later chapters and complete this. The next is one of the most important mechanics in the game, the Synchro Device. Remember how it said you should only level 5 units? You're about to learn why. You unlock this sometime in Chapter 4, but instead of having to level every character you get, you can put a level 1 unit into one of the slots and it will automatically match its level to the lowest of your top 5 highest level units. So for example here in this screenshot, Maxwell is the lowest of this player's 5 highest level units. So all units synced up from one of the slots are all level 57. There's functionally no difference between a naturally level unit versus one that's synced up in the device. So select your best 5 units and level them. You can unlock more slots with gems, but there's also some free slots if you do some of the academy lessons too. Do not level a blue character. They have a very low level cap, so I will recommend leveling SR units instead. If you ever regret leveling someone, you can reset their levels with a small price of gems. Next up, we have the Commander's Room. You can view lore, past story cutscenes, listen to the OST, but the major function of this room is the Advice section. You can enter a dialogue with any of your characters, and based on whether or not you responded correctly, will increase your bond with that character by 50 or 100 if you got it right. You can also gift them stuff if you're in a hurry. By increasing bond, the unit stats will be increased. It's not a big boost, but it's still an improvement. Next, we have the Recycling Room. This is where, again, you can level the stats of your units. Using these token things, if you have enough of them, you can upgrade by class or manufacturer. There's no way to specifically farm for these things, but they give those out like candy during events, and you'll just get some passively. You can buy them from the shop, but I will go over the shop later. Lastly on the first row, we have the infrastructure core. I'll be honest, I still don't know exactly how to level up this thing, but I did it just by progressing through the game naturally. You get these cores that will unlock quality of life features in the outpost. I have no idea why you have to unlock these, but it's there, so why not? We're gonna skip the elevator for now since that comes later into the game. The bulletin board is basically like expeditions in Genshin, where you send units on hours-long trips to bring back materials. The units don't actually become unavailable, so don't be afraid to send them out. I just collect this once a day, but it's just another source of passive income. Lastly is the outpost defense. This is the thing I talked about where it passively collects goodies depending on how far you made it into the campaign, which is why I recommend doing that as a new player. You can view this in the main menu, but it will fill up completely every 12 hours, so as long as you log in before it's full, you'll be able to get the most out of it. So that's the outpost. Now we move on to the arc menu, and we'll start from the top going clockwise. The Lost Sector is a mini-game where you navigate a map solving various puzzles and engaging in fights. In exchange for completing them, you get these things called Harmony Cubes that can be placed on your Nikkei for a further boost in power. I won't get into it since I plan on making a separate video on cubes. Then there's the Tribe Tower. It's kind of like a challenge mode that gets harder the higher you climb. There's the Normal Tower where any unit can be used. Then there's the Manufacturer Exclusive Towers where only units from a certain manufacturer can be used. Don't be too worried if you can't do these right away, you'll eventually get enough characters to be able to compete in these. The arena is the game's PvP system. I don't focus on it, I think it's just whale bait. There's two arena modes. In the rookie arena, you form your team and battle someone else. Except in PvP mode, you can't control anything, so you just watch whether or not your team wins. Same goes for the special arena, where you prepare three teams to fight back to back. There's very little skill involved, and the arena is essentially just the dick measuring contest to see who has the most kitted out roster. As long as you participate in it, you get this currency called arena vouchers to exchange for skill leveling materials. I have so many of these that I don't know what to do with. Again, these won't give you any major advantages over other players, but as long as you participate in it, you'll be drowning in these vouchers. Now we have Interception, which is like a boss battle mode where you get rewards based on how much damage you dealt to the boss before your team got wiped out. Alternatively, if you beat the boss before the timer is up, then you get the best possible reward. You absolutely want to do this mode every day. From the first Altaisen challenge, you can get the highest tier of equipment for new players. Because of the quick farming feature, you don't have to run the level three times. Pressing quick farm will give you rewards based on the best attempt you had today. 
So if you beat the boss on the first try, you can just get the highest tier rewards another two times immediately. Just a note, if you restart the level midway, it will not count as an attempt. So if you know that you can do better, this is something you can do. But just be warned, if your team wipes where the timer is up, then it will be registered as an attempt. Lastly, there is the simulation room. It's kind of like a roguelike dungeon crawler where you see how far you can get. There are three stages to each difficulty. I will recommend doing the highest difficulty that is unlocked, but some of them can be a big spike. You select buffs between each level and your buffs will get stronger the more of the same shape of buffs that you have. I can't go through all of the details to tell you which ones are good, but I would personally try to get 8 of the same buffs with the same shape. The interesting bit is that when one of your unit dies, they're down for good unless you use a buff that revives them. However, you can replace them with another unit. So technically, you can't lose as long as you have new units to spare. Just like interceptions, if you're not satisfied with how the level is going and you know you can save your units, then just restart the level and you can try again. The simulation room drops the materials needed to level your unit skills. So this is also good to run once a day. We'll go back to the main menu and I'll go through the tabs that are worth explaining. The rest I'll leave you to explore. We have the Friends tab, where you can have up to 30 friends. You can send these hearts to everyone and also receive them once a day. With these hearts, you can roll on the Friend Point Gacha. The rates for SSRs are half tier, but you can still actually get them. Which is quite nice. Just spam out friend invitations just like a junior software engineer spamming out job applications. Try to fill the 30 friend slots for max efficiency. There's no difference between a high level friend versus one that just started playing yesterday. Give me those hearts and we're cool. Below that we have unions. You don't need to join one right away, but I would say it's best to join one in the long term. Each month there is a union raid where you get currency needed to upgrade the harmony cubes. It's admittedly more of a late game thing, but it doesn't hurt to start right away. On the left side, each month also has a solo raid where you can participate to, again, get materials for the Harmony Cubes. It's a late game thing, you can start doing it, but don't expect to get very far. Right, now we talk about everyone's favorite modern video game mechanic, microtransactions. In the cash shop, it's where you go to spend real life money for in-game items. If you ask me, 99% of the shop is a scam. They're outrageously priced and unless you're a whale, I wouldn't buy these. I consider myself as a low spender, I buy the 30 days supply, which for $5, you can get 100 gems every day for 30 days. It's basically like Welkin from Genshin, and one of the few packages that are actually worth it. You can also buy skins, and I know we all joke about $20 skins, but Nikkei is a mobile game through and through. Another package I would consider is the new Commander SSR pack. This lets you pick from 4 SSR units. I think volume is the best choice here, but I still haven't bought this, so it's up to you. Now to answer a question real quick, but is this game pay to win? I don't think so. It depends on your definition of winning. I mean, if you whale the hell out of this game, you can probably reach the top places in PvP or raid content. But other than a bit more currency, you don't actually get anything for placing on the leaderboards. I've been playing since launch, and due to the generous gacha, I have a lot of the SSRs in the game, even as a low spender. I'm just having fun collecting new characters and building them up for challenge content, so being free to play is completely viable. Below the cash shop is the normal shop. Here we spend in-game currency for in-game items. In the general shop, you can spend gems or credits for items. I don't buy anything here except for taking the freebie item every day. I think all of these sales are not in your favor at all, and I would especially be careful with buying things with gems, as that is used in the gacha, and spending gems here means potentially missing out on a brand new character. The second tab is the union shop. Don't worry about this just yet, you get the union chips from participating in the union raids. It's more of a late game thing, so you can ignore this for now. The body label shop is where you can buy these tokens to level up a specific class or manufacturer. Again, I think this entire shop is a scam, except for the mold at the bottom. Always buy these. You can get body labels by just rolling on the gacha, and with SSR molds, you can get a random SSR and potentially progress faster. The tokens are outrageously priced, and when you get to a certain level, you need 50 of them to level up once. I think I'll pass. Next is the Arena Shop. You get the vouchers for participating in PvP. Again, I don't focus on it, and you can see that I have more vouchers than I know what to do with. You use them to buy the manuals needed for skill leveling. Absolutely do not buy the gear for sale here. It's always a tier lower than what you can get from Interception. It's literally a scam. Next is the Mileage Shop, and this is essentially the game's pity system. I'm going to make a separate video on the gacha, so we'll wait until that video comes out. 
Lastly is the recycling shop. You get broken cores from participating from co-op events, where you team up with four other players to fight a boss. Don't worry, it's super easy. As long as your team has an IQ higher than the average Genshin player, you should be fine. I always buy the gems first, then the different currencies at the bottom. The tickets are for increasing bond with your characters. You can get them if you want, but I will focus on the materials first. Finally, we'll talk about events. Luckily, Nikkei seems to be very active in the events department. There's almost always an event happening. Right now, we have the near collab. There's two types of events. A normal event with a login bonus, a story mode, and a challenge mode. These events will run for two weeks. The other type of event features a larger scale. They will have an explorable map, a co-op mode, two story modes, a challenge mode, and a minigame. These bigger events will typically run for three weeks instead. As a new player, most of these things can be done pretty easily. You get five event tokens a day, so you can clear five levels in the story. Before you do that, certain units will give you a drop bonus of the event currency. When forming your team, check which units have a bonus and try to form a team where your rate of getting bonus event currency adds up to above 100%. This means whenever you complete a level, you are guaranteed to get bonus event currency. With the quick farm feature, you just have to run a level once and you'll be able to instantly claim the rewards on subsequent plays. There will also be a hard mode to each event story. Don't be discouraged if you can't fully clear this. I couldn't on my first couple of events. The only significant thing you get from hard mode is a bonus cutscene if you manage to full clear it. Challenge mode is pretty straightforward. Fight the boss, get rewards. Again, don't worry too much if you can't clear the full set of challenges for now. During these bigger events, you can also explore the map to get goodies, including exclusive OST tracks. One thing I do want to warn you is that you should pay attention to when the event ends, as you want to spend all of your event currency for stuff in the shop. Always prioritize the tickets, as those can get you new units from the gacha. Then you can get whatever you want. But as long as you spend your event tokens every day, you can clear out the shop. However, the game does not warn you to exchange your currency when the event ends, so if you still got unspent currency before the event goes away, make sure to spend them, as there's no way to exchange them anymore once the event is over. Okay, that was quite the mouthful, but hopefully I was able to provide a good introduction to the game, as well as giving some guidance on how to navigate around it. There's still a ton of stuff that we haven't covered, but for now, I think this is a good baseline of information to start from. Thank you for tuning in to the first volume of Commander Bootcamp, and I'll see you next time. Enjoy collecting waifus, and always remember, have fun with the game.